Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I know it's very late in the afternoon, and I know from my own experience how difficult it is to stay until the very end. We are approaching the end of the forum, and yet I see a very good turnout this afternoon. Thank you very much for coming to the session. I see familiar faces here and there, and uh, I'm very uh, uh, pleased again to uh, stand here to moderate this very final session on important issue of youth transition. I think by now uh, we should ask ourselves, especially those who work in education and training field, given all these changes and uncertainties, crisis, knowledge economy, and so on and so forth, what can education do? to prepare people for the changing world, especially preparing youngsters for this ever-changing world. I don't know who is the one who coined this concept, knowledge economy, but if I recall correctly, uh, when people start, started to talk about knowledge economy, the picture was more or less rosy, so that if we are well educated, well uh, informed, I mean jobs will be there and uh, our job prospect, life prospect will improve. If we gain more knowledge, if we integrate or adjust ourselves somehow to this phenomenon called the knowledge economy. But by now, if I'm not mistaken, I mean it seems like an illusion. Why? Because if you look at, uh, for example, the status of youth in terms of their uh, quality of living, especially their job prospect, is very gloomy. In many countries around the world, the youth unemployment is two, three times higher than average unemployment rate. Beth, is it right? In Korea, in Thailand. I'm sorry, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm, my name is Gwang Jo Kim, <laughs> Director of UNESCO Office in Bangkok, which is also uh, UNESCO's Asia Pacific Regional Bureau for Education. We, I am based in Bangkok, Thailand. So my host country, Thailand, is not an exception to that. So again, how, what education can do to people in general and to young people in particular who have to bear all the brunt of these changes. So in that regard, talking about this issue of youth transition, I think is very timely and pertinent. So we have today two speakers who will speak about this issue of youth transition. But the second speaker will be talking about Human Resource Development Index in the context of youth transition, if I'm not mistaken. So seemingly uh, unrelated uh, issues are, in my view, uh, well interlinked. So the question is, for example, the, <clears throat> the thing called school-to-work transition. The many countries have own, their own programs and approaches but most of the programs are were developed during the so-called industrial age. So the question is whether this year-old system of school, work to, school to work transition uh, paradigm still valid in view of despite all these changes. If not, what might be possible solutions? What might be ways of amending the existing formula. The another set of questions that we may ask was where countries stand in terms of preparing their youngsters for the world of work? There's many approaches. We can think of many approaches. One such approach would be to benchmark a different system at the country level. I, I understand human resource development indexes 
is <clears throat> about this issue, and also I understand my colleagues from the World Bank. Uh, with us, we are working on this assessment and benchmarking exercise. So this set of questions, in my view, is highly uh, relevant and important questions for us to raise. So we have two speakers and three discussions, knowing that we have to finish by 5.40, so about an hour and 10 minutes. In terms of managing t the time, I'll be very parsimonious. I'll give 15 minutes to two speakers and five minutes to three discussions so that we, we will have at least half an hour for exchange of ideas and questions and answers between the panel and the floor. I think it's important for us to uh, have maximum exchange of ideas, interaction amongst us. Because, as I said, we are opposing the end of this forum. I know that we, there are lots of things that we can learn from each other, not only from the speakers, but from people in the fl floor. So if you agree, again, 15 minutes for presentation, five minutes uh, discussion discussion for the discussion panel. So let me now introduce our distinguished speakers. To my left, uh, Mr. David Achorena, who is the director of Division for Education, Strategies, and Capacity Building at UNESCO. He's a very close colleague of mine. Before he took up current post, Mr. Achorena worked as a senior program specialist at International Institute for Educational Planning, otherwise known as IIEP at UNESCO. He worked for French Minister of Education and also for Minister of Finance and Planning in St. Lucia, I believe it's in, in the Caribbean. And also he taught at the University of Nottingham, United Kingdom. He has a wide area of expertise, including education planning and policy making, technical and vocational education, and lifelong learning. Thank you, David, for joining us. And next to him, uh, Mr. Hansago, who is the professor of education at Seoul National University. Uh, professor O at Seoul Nation, National University is now leading Korea Human Resource Research Center at Seoul National University. Before joining Seoul National University as a professor, he was, like myself, in my previous work for the Minister of Education in the government of Korea as deputy director. Next to him, uh, Mr. Woo Young Kim. Mr. Kim is professor of <clears throat> economics and business at Gongju National University. He is currently uh, advising uh, several provincial governments, including Daejeon and Chungnam. He is a labor economist, and he specializes, he specializes in industrial relations and international economics. And next to him, uh, Dr. Anguk Kim, who is a research fellow at the CREVET, one of the co-hosts of this important forum. Uh, his expertise include youth employment and public uh, training policy. Before joining CREVET, he worked for Korea Labor Institute just briefly. Last but not least, let me introduce Mr. Sungmin Bak, who is uh, now with the World Bank. He's an uh, education specialist at Human Development Network of the World Bank, of which the director is Elizabeth King, who is, who, who is honoring us to be in this session. Dr. King is over there. And the Dr. Park is, uh, <clears throat> worked for the office of the president before he joined World Bank. And before that, he worked for the Minister of Education. And also, he worked for the Minister of Industrial Policy. He is currently working on uh, operation analytic work on TVET, technical and vocational education, technical and vocational education and training in the World Bank, and also he is part of World Bank's benchmarking task force. 
So with this, I would like to invite our first speaker, Mr. David Achvarena. David, thank you. Thank you, uh, Guangzhou, for these words of introduction. Well, I'd like, first of all, before starting my presentation, to, to thank the organizers of the uh, HR Forum for inviting us to, to this uh, important event and to, for inviting me to make this presentation. I'd like, in particular, to uh, thank uh, Krivet and uh, his president, Professor Kwon. Uh, I must say before, as a, an introduction, that uh, technical and vocational education and training is uh, one of the areas of work of, of UNESCO as part of our education program, and in fact is becoming uh, increasingly an important area for us. We have uh, last year uh, issued uh, a strategy for technical and vocational education and training which provides uh, the frame for our work, both at country level where we support uh, policy development and capacity building in this area, but also at the global level where we work uh, on studies that also on facilitating the dialogue with other international agencies, starting with uh, ILO, uh, on matters related to technical and vocational education and training. So within that framework, um, transition from school to work is, of course, a very important topic. In fact, not only for technical education per se, but for education policies at large. You had earlier uh, this afternoon a session on uh, skills development for aging uh, population, and in fact it's interesting to note that uh, in a large number of countries, and in particular in OECD countries, which are really uh, most of them facing acute problems uh, related to the aging society, uh, when you look at the situation at the labor market, you see that there are two, I would say, uh, critical problems. One, uh, at the start of the really entry point into the labor market, and this is what we're going to discuss this afternoon now, the access of young people into the labor market, but at the same time you also have, you know, uh, at the end uh, of a spectrum, increasingly problems with uh, senior uh, workers, and in many uh, OECD countries, the uh, participation rate uh, for senior workers, workers of 50 years and above, is, is quite low. So this is, a, a, you know, quite a complex situation that uh, governments have to face, uh, being, well, challenged, you know, both by the issue of uh, youth and youth uh, employment, but also now, as you've discussed a while ago, issues related to uh, older workers. Um, just a few words regarding, uh, as an introduction, to, to set the, the context. I mean, uh, youth transition to work is, is not a new Topic. It's a topic uh, which in many countries, in fact, is, is a, a structural problem, you know, where uh, typically, as uh, Guangzhou was indicating, the uh, unemployment rate for young people is uh, uh, several times higher than the average unemployment rate for the uh, active population. Uh, but uh, in recent years, uh, as a result of a financial crisis that was discussed uh, in several occasions during this forum, we've seen uh, a further deterioration of the situation uh, of uh, um, young people on the labor market. And you have here some uh, figures that uh, were issued by the uh, recently published uh, ILO Global uh, Employment Trends for Youth uh, for 2010, uh, where well, you see that both in terms of the total number of youth uh, unemployed, but also uh, in terms of the unemployment rate uh, for young people, we've seen uh, an increase in recent years as a result, a direct result of the uh, economic and financial crisis. So we've had, I would say, uh, an aggravating factor uh, which is adding to what is in many countries uh, a structural issue. So why so many uh, governments, I would say, uh, focus on, on youth, uh, youth policies and uh, employment policies for youth. But there is, of course, an economic uh, concern uh, in terms of, I would say, human capital, the fact that uh, not using uh, uh, this source of labor is a loss for the economy. But there is also a social concern. Uh, youth are also a group at risk in many uh, 
countries. It's, uh, it's a critical age in terms of the transition from uh, childhood to adulthood. So uh, this unemployment issue uh, aggravates uh, a situation which is in many countries uh, uh, quite uh, uh, challenging. I remember a few years back um, uh, a mission to, to the Samoa where I was very surprised to, to see that uh, we were discussing uh, strategies for uh, at-risk groups and, and youth you know, at large were identified uh, by the, the government as a, a group uh, at risk. There are also other concerns which are related to the, I would say, political and social situation and stability of the country. Some of you may have seen recently on, the, on TV the news uh, and the pictures of the, the streets of, uh, of Paris uh, during the last days where we've had a lot of demonstrations uh, with uh, uh, youngsters, both uh, high school students and university students. And those demonstrations are, uh, to a large extent, also related to uh, a fear in relation to uh, access to employment. We also know that in some countries, in particular in uh, Central America, we see very critical situations where, in fact, uh, in fact it's a, a segment of the youth population which is uh, virtually uh, at war. You know, it's a conflict armed with, uh, with government and with the rest of society. So we've seen very difficult uh, uh, situations in, in some countries in relation to uh, the youth issue, which is much broader than only uh, an, um, an unemployment or employment uh, issue. Now, uh, I'd like also to uh, stress the fact that this issue is quite complex. Of course, we tend to focus on the uh, unemployment rate as, uh, as the indicator to reflect the situation uh, of young people on the labor market, but it's only one aspect. Um, first of all, we have to look also at the conditions of work. Often, even when people, young people do find jobs, the uh, working conditions are quite poor. And again, uh, this relates to the, the concept of decent work that uh, uh, promotes uh, uh, ILO. And in a, number of, uh, in a large number of countries, we have We've seen the emergence of a new category uh, of, of young people, or a new statistical category, which is the percentage of youth who are never in education nor uh, in employment. So in other words, we have in a number of countries a large segment of a young population that we can uh, say are discouraged and are no longer uh, looking for a job, but are, non, uh, are no not participating in any education and training program. And this uh, issue is particularly acute uh, in, uh, in Latin America and in the Caribbean, and it's coming also is becoming an issue in many countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. Finally, uh, we also have to stress that uh, in many low-income countries, labor markets for youth are mostly uh, in the informal economy. Uh, so it's only a very small percentage uh, which has access to work in the so-called structured uh, uh, economy or, or, or labor market. Uh, another uh, comment regarding uh, the concept of transition. I mean, what, what do we mean by transition? In fact, when we look at the, the situation of uh, uh, young people and this process, you know, from uh, school to the labor market, we've seen in many countries that there has been uh, a, a, changing, a changing pattern. Now we see that, uh, first of all, uh, many young people do combine many activities at the same time. I mean, they, they, they study and they are at university at the same time, so it is sometimes difficult uh, statistically to know if they are workers or if they, if they are students. Another element which uh, has been identified in many countries is the fact that the transition process uh, is getting much longer. In other words, the time it takes for a graduate to find let's see, what we would call a, a stable uh, employment uh, on the labor market is getting longer and longer. So this is also one of the signs of the deterioration of the labor market for, for young people. Uh, if we look at the, the situation in terms of education levels, we've seen uh, in uh, OECD countries uh, a large you know, expansion of education systems uh, in, reflected in the fact that the profile of long, young people is, is no longer the same. Uh, until the mid-70s, the majority of young people were entering the labor market at the end of compulsory education. We've seen now uh, a, a, well, a marked difference, and I think that uh, Korea is a very uh, 
a strong illustration of this uh, fact, where uh, a large, if not the majority, of the young people who enter the labor market do have a tertiary level uh, qualification. So the, the uh, problematic is no longer the same in terms of the relationship between the structure uh, of employment on the labor market and the education profile of, of the youngsters. What has been the response uh, of uh, education systems uh, in, this, uh, in this context? Uh, first of all, the broadening uh, of the, the content uh, of uh, vocational tracks uh, has been uh, in many countries used as a way uh, to uh, address this uh, issue uh, through facilitating mobility uh, on the labor market. Uh, in other words, uh, the rationale has been to uh, avoid uh, giving a, a narrow specialization uh, to students, but to give them rather than training for a particular occupation, but preparing them for a range of occupations within a particular skill area. So this uh, uh, strategy has been uh, implemented in, in a number of countries where, in fact, even in some of them, you see that uh, the difference between uh, vocational and uh, general uh, tracks uh, is not as, as clear as it used to be. Uh, also, apprenticeship systems uh, are, are being uh, uh, modernized or reformed in, uh, in, in many countries. Uh, of course, these uh, reforms depend very much on the uh, features of, of apprenticeship schemes. Um, the main areas of improvement uh, uh, relate to, first of all, improving the quality uh, of training, in, including, uh, in particular, the quality of general education for apprentices. Uh, establishing certification in many countries where there is uh, apprenticeship but only, only through uh, a traditional form of apprenticeship, there is no uh, certification. And this is the case in many countries, for instance, in West Africa. So establishing a certification system uh, constitutes a very important uh, strategy to upgrade and improve this, uh, this scheme. Now, uh, extending the age limit also and facilitating uh, forms of apprenticeship at tertiary level is also an element uh, which uh, contributed to upgrading and improving the content uh, and effectiveness of apprenticeship uh, training. Uh, further involving uh, uh, social partners is also a key element. Uh, well, you've heard already and most of you are aware of the dual system in Germany and so clearly the uh, deep involvement of the social partners is uh, one of the, the key uh, elements to the success of the uh, German uh, system. Uh, another issue which in fact has been, has been discussed uh, already quite a lot during uh, this forum is the, the so-called uh, uh, parity of esteem between uh, general and vocational education. The fact that in many countries vocational education is not seen as uh, an attractive a form of education by both students and parents, and we heard that this is the case, for instance, in, uh, in Korea. So uh, in introducing more uh, flexibility within the education system and uh, improving articulation between general and vocational tracks has been, uh, you know, contributing to uh, alleviate this, uh, this problem. Another uh, reform has been to facilitate further education at the end of the vocational education streams to ensure that students can have access also to tertiary education uh, uh, facilities. Uh, introducing new subjects which are more attractive uh, for young people like ICT uh, has also be, been introduced as a, as, as a strategy to do this. And again, uh, the Singapore uh, example had been, has been uh, mentioned earlier this morning which gives a, a good illustration of this, uh, of this strategy. Uh, now, we also have to look at this in the context of higher education, not only in the context of vocational uh, education at secondary level. And indeed, here again, we've seen that uh, in most countries, the uh, structure and the nature of uh, higher education has, uh, has changed. Uh, many countries have introduced uh, uh, new types of uh, vocational education at tertiary level, uh, which is seen as really uh, a, well, a strategy also which contributes to uh, facilitate transition from uh, university to, to the labor market. Again, those are issues which I think are very, uh, for instance, uh, relevant to the debate here in, in Korea. 
um, a number of uh, areas which uh, needs to be also um, looked at and explored to improving the, the match uh, and the transition process. Uh, I want to stress that the, the response is not only an education response. There are a number of other forms of support, including uh, in, uh, providing information, improving the transparency uh, of the labor market, uh, providing guidance uh, um, to, to young students, which also uh, contribute to facilitating this, uh, this transition. Uh, concluding remarks, um, again, this is a very complex uh, issue. It's difficult to uh, generalize, although I've tried to identify some uh, uh, trends and responses which are common to, to many countries. But uh, this is an issue that needs to be placed and looked at within the particular context of, of, of countries, and in particular, both their education system and their uh, labor market uh, system. Um, it, another element which is very important to, to, to stress is the fact that facilitating uh, the transition process uh, requires also uh, a very, um, I would say, early intervention. In other words, in some countries you have a process where school uh, a failure uh, leads eventually young people uh, to vocational education uh, and then to uh, unemployment. So it's, you have to really act uh, as early as possible to ensure that uh, in the basic education, at the basic education, education level, the, the quality uh, of, of uh, education and uh, the learning achievements are, are stronger to ensure that, first of all, um, option for vocational education is, uh, is chosen by, uh, by students, but also to ensure that they have the capacities really to, to learn and to eventually uh, study uh, further. To end, I would just uh, like to stress again that uh, the strategies which are put in place uh, to facilitate uh, this transition have to be placed uh, at the articulation between education and also labor market uh, policy. So there are issues uh, which can only be uh, um, addressed within our broader measures to uh, facilitate and to provide incentives also to employers uh, to recruit and to hire young people. So, of course, the education response is, uh, is a key element, but it has, to be, it has to be coupled with other forms of interventions, in particular, uh, for instance, in relation to uh, active labor market uh, policies. So again, this is another area where we see that the policy consistency is a key element to uh, success. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David, for your excellent presentation. I think you, uh, taught, you told us about the key issues and reform measures. Uh, maybe one question for you. Uh, guidance counseling, uh, this, this service, I think, is critical. But what if, how would you uh, advise youngsters for jobs which are not, which have yet to be created, I should say? For the existing jobs, you can ask employers to pro provide information. What about the jobs which are not exist as of now? With that, I would like to invite Professor O. Uh, who is going to uh, tell us about Global HRD Competitiveness Initiative. Professor o, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you for the introduction. Well, uh, moderate gave me a second pressure for the timekeeping. He only gave me 15 minutes, so I have around uh, 30 slides of the content, so I will do my best. Uh, before I start my presentation, uh, I would like to uh, thank you first for the moderator, Dr. Gwangjo Kim, because he uh, initiated the idea that the university needs some research center, which is focused on some, uh, some areas, like a human resource. He decided to uh, support six, area of, uh, six area, uh, areas of uh, policy-focused uh, university-based research center. 
and uh, Korea Human Resource Research Center is one of them. Uh, I would like to thank you for his effort and leadership. Uh, today's uh, present presentation topic is about uh, Global Human Resource Development Competitiveness Report, 2010. Actually, this report is not so much focused on uh, youth transition to work, but I hope uh, this report uh, can help us to understand a uh, broader and more uh, macro perspective of education and human resource development system. The content of the presentation uh, was, uh, were separated into four different parts. Uh, first one is introduction of a new index, uh, theoretical framework, and indicators. And finally, uh, I would like to uh, talk about country uh, ratings and some analysis and uh, implications for further uh, human resource policies. Why do we need to develop a new index? There are so many uh, indexes which is focused on national uh, competitiveness or some uh, issue of talent or education. A new index uh, was required to assess the national competitiveness from only on a human resource development perspective and also to measure competitiveness of national uh, human resource development based on a theoretical model. Theoretical model is quite important because uh, without having some empirical evidence, we cannot uh, predict the future uh, validity of the model. And also, uh, the new index is required to reflect the whole picture rather than opinions of a specific population. As you may know, a national competitiveness report have been frequently used to measure competitiveness of national human resources or education system. For example, IMD World Competitiveness Yearbook, World Economic Forum Global Competitiveness Report, and also IPS National Competitiveness Research are the typical examples. However, this approach has the following limitations. They are based on an economy-centered uh, perspective. And also, uh, they are relevant uh, indicators are not selected based on a theoretical model, except IPS model. Results are largely influenced by cooperation executive responses in survey. Uh, most of the national competitive rep report has one-third uh, of its indicators based on uh, surveys. So uh, I tried to develop the new uh, way of uh, assessing a national human resource development system based on the system model, which has three different components in the model, development, utilization, and distribution. These three uh, critical elements work together as a system. Without fully understanding utilization and distribution of human resources in one country, we cannot uh, is solve the uh, problem of education or, or development system. Why does the index attempt to measure competitiveness of national human resource development system? There is some ambiguity of the concept of national human resources in this globalization era. Um, many highly qualified workers move around the world and, and also uh, underdeveloped, uh, underdeveloped or low-skilled uh, persons uh, the workforce can move in some specific areas these days. So what matters is how effectively and efficiently each nation develops, distributes, utilize, and even attract uh, human resources. So I try to determine the four different uh, factors which, uh, which can contribute to the competitiveness of human resource development. What's, what are the determinants of the competitiveness of national HRD systems? Determinants are different from achievement or outcomes itself. For example, national PISA scores, number of social science indexes, CCs, or Nobel Prizes are outcomes rather than determinant of national human resource development competitiveness. I uh, referred to some theoretical framework uh, which uh, have some validity and reliability uh, even though it, it is more focused on national competitiveness. Michael Porter's diamond model, one of the examples. 
But this model mainly focused on uh, the firm's competitiveness. Uh, I will skip the specific details of the model. And second one is Noel Tice's TPC matrix, which includes technical, political, and cultural system. And these three different systems work together uh, when we talk about national competitiveness. And third component is the social capital theory. You know, social capital uh, is defined as a social cooperation, mutual trust, civic participation, uh, etc. And social capital uh, influence a lot on developing human capital. And last piece of the theoretical framework uh, is about influences of globalization. Survival in the global market calls for increased competition. And this in increased competition calls for the new approach in the labor market. Increased access to cultural diversity brings about spreading of multiculturalism. Information flows between geographically remote locations are very dynamic and active. Based on uh, this uh, theoretical review, I uh, developed a four uh, determinant model, which is called SES model, supply, demand, and environment supporting systems. These four determinants work together as a system, particularly interaction between supply and uh, demand conditions are quite important. Let me introduce some uh, uh, indicators briefly. Uh, supply conditions has two different uh, measures, which is uh, quantity and quality. Quantity measure uh, include birth rate, life expectancy, quality measure, percent, uh, percentage of population with the secondary and tertiary education, and enrollment rate. Demand conditions were also classified into quantity and quality measures. Percentage of active population, employment, and unemployment rate was, were the quantity measure. And employment rate of population with the secondary and tertiary education. Uh, and unemployment rate of population with the secondary and tertiary education were the quality measures. Environment uh, determinant was classified uh, into technology, culture, and globalization. Technology Major included number of computers, internet users, mobile phone uh, subscriptions per 100 population. Cultural measures were acceptance of novel ideas, acceptance of making challenges and taking risks. And, uh, and finally, belongings to a community. Uh, globalization measure included uh, respect for diversity, global citizenship, uh, percentage of foreign students, and number of international meetings. Uh, final uh, determinant are uh, supporting systems. These uh, determinants include investment and institutions. Investment measures include the public uh, private investment on education and research and development. Institution measures uh, were protection of intellectual property, uh, treatment of female human resources, and transparency of government policies. There are a lot of resources utilized for uh, selecting uh, hard data. I, uh, I try to avoid using uh, subjective measures uh, like a survey. Uh, even when I used the uh, survey data, I used uh, the authorized, uh, authorized uh, survey data like a world value survey. Uh, OECD education at a glance, employment outlook, UNDP's human development report, International Congress and Convention Association report, Transparency International uh, 2009, World Economic Forum Global Competitiveness Report, and also IPS National Competitiveness Research were used. Indicators are standardized. Uh, those scores are transformed into G scores, whose mean is uh, zero and standard deviation was one. Uh, P value was multiplied uh, by 100. Uh, for uh, scoring each country's ranking. Missing values were used uh, most recent data if available. Otherwise, uh, substitute with the mean score. These indicators are uh, validated by uh, many experts in education, labor, economics, and statistics. And statistical analysis wa was done, and you can take a look at uh, brief uh, scores like this one. Uh, correlation between uh, 
Human Resource Development System uh, Index with the GDP per capita or was uh, 0.62, and relationship with correlation with the uh, GDP per work hour was 0.59. Uh, based on uh, this procedure, uh, the country rankings were evaluated. As you can see, uh, Norway ranked first, Sweden second, and and etc. You know, in in the first group. Uh, there are, there are many European countries, and, and Korea ranked 20th, and, uh, and Korea is in the middle group, and other, uh, other many European countries in the third group. These days, uh, G20 summit is being held in Seoul, so I intentionally uh, picked out those countries. Only 12 countries of G20 countries are the OECD members. So Austria ranked first, Canada second, and uh, Korea ranked eight among uh, 20 countries. This is just for your reference. And last, last, uh, next slide is about uh, comparison between uh, country groups. I compared top five countries uh, with the bottom five. Uh, in the graph, institution measures show the big difference, these two country groups. And next big difference uh, can be found in the area of quality and quantity of uh, demand condition. Demand condition uh, play the key role uh, in human resource development competitiveness. And next, uh, next difference was found in the quality of the supply condition. Whenever we compare the top five and the last five, you know, there is always a difference, can, a difference found. So I compared the first group and second group. Uh, in this comparison, uh, I found uh, the difference in the area of quality and quantity of demand condition. So when we uh, understand the competitiveness of human resource development system, Labor market condition uh, play the key role. Let's take a look at the Korea profile. Uh, Korea has both strengths and weaknesses. Uh, strength area is, uh, is uh, quality of supply condition, which means uh, Korea has highly qualified, uh, educated workforce. And uh, another area is investment, investment in education, which mainly come from a private investment in elementary and secondary school. But there are some critical uh, weaknesses areas, like uh, quantity of supply condition, which mainly come from the lowest birth rate. And recently, the uh, Korean government uh, released a national comprehensive plan. Well, uh, in global globalization uh, determinant and institution determinant uh, ranked quite low, uh, like uh, as you can see. So other pieces uh, are just for your information. In, in other uh, specific determinant, uh, you can have some reference. So uh, with the time limit, I will skip all this slide. And a uh, new file will be uh, placed on the website of this forum. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Lo. Firstly, for your compliment. Indeed, it was me uh, who encouraged the university to undertake research in this area. Uh, it was a very interesting exercise. I'm looking forward to uh, some reactions from experts from the World Bank because I think they are doing the similar exercise at the country level. Okay, now let me invite the first discussant, <clears throat> Professor Kim. Yeah. You have uh, four minutes. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, my name is uh, Woo Young Kim, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm honored to be here to make uh, comments on uh, two very important uh, papers. Uh, before the session, actually, I asked the speakers to take time
time as long as possible because I don't have many comments to make. And I'm grateful, grateful they answered my request. So, okay. Uh, uh, as you know, there, uh, these two topics are very important ones. And one is uh, the transition from uh, school to work. And this is just, uh, we have ongoing debates. There are no uh, uh, certain answers. We are still looking for answers. And the second one is very, to me, it was a very interesting uh, topic. And he tried to measure a new index which he, uh, can tell us how the competitive the country is in terms of uh, HRD. And because uh, I'm a discussant, I felt obliged to make some uh, uh, creative uh, uh, and uh, constructive comments. So I prepared a uh, uh, few slides. Okay. Okay, the so first two comments on the strategy for school to work transition. Okay, down. okay so generally, in, you know, the many points made by the author are well taken. And as you know, the uh, youth unemployment rate is usually much higher than adult unemployment rates. And the uh, youth un unemployment rate is important because they are entering the labor market, and if they don't get uh, jobs, uh, they are frust frustrated, and uh, from then, uh, you know, they don't have a good pass in the, in the labor market. So we are mainly very much interested in the uh, transition of young workers in the uh, labor market. And the education reforms, uh, voca vocational training, Government interventions, yeah, they are all uh, very important, and uh, we are still discussing the, the forms, uh, desirable uh, uh, shapes of these uh, interventions. Okay. And I, I'd like to add some, uh, uh, you know, some uh, important things not included in this paper. Uh, okay, the first one is the minimum wages. So, the, you know, the author, uh, the Dr. Uh, Achurina, he is talking about uh, a school to, to work. And one of the important institutions is minimum wages. And we all know that uh, the minimum wages affect employment uh, of, of youth. So many countries uh, uh, try to, you know, choose the right or proper minimum wages uh, that uh, kind of reduce the adverse effect of uh, youth uh, employment. So, uh, I mean, there are lots of uh, literatures and studies uh, which look at the minimum wages in the Western countries, but there are very few studies uh, uh, dealing with Asian countries like Korea and Japan. Okay? So this issue we have to uh, investigate more in the future. And the child labor, uh, the, 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 the youth is from age 15 to 24, so maybe, uh, maybe it's not really appropriate to, to mention child labor, but uh, the, you know, the youth, young people who are supposed to be in the school are forced to work. Uh, we, may, we may consider them as a child labor. And, and it's not a problem in the developed countries, but it is a very uh, a serious problem in developing countries. And the decent work, yes, yeah, some countries like Korea, uh, we have like about eight or nine percent unemployment rate in Korea in, in, in youth unemployment rate. And many people uh, pointed out that the major, one of the major sources, reasons of un high unemployment rate in, in the youth is because of uh, uh, lack of decent work. So uh, uh, we have to uh, think about more, we have to think more about how to create decent work to uh, reduce youth unemployment rate. Okay, uh, the, the, I mean, when I think about uh, this youth unemployment rate, I always uh, have a puzzle. Uh, why we have this oversupplied uh, university graduates and mismatch between studies and uh, uh, types of work and uh, uh, why these problems cannot be solved in the labor market. 
I mean, we, if the labor market is really competitive and perfect, then we shouldn't have these mismatches and over uh, 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 education because when people think they are over educated, then they try to reduce the uh, you know the amount of education to adjust in the labor market. So. Uh, the, and the fundamental question is why the labor market cannot solve these problems by itself, and uh, what are the sources of uh, labor, uh, the market failures? Uh, we have to think more uh, carefully about uh, these issues before uh, we uh, introduce government interventions and, and other uh, measures to reduce uh, youth unemployment rate. Okay, that's the uh, comments on the uh, first paper. And the second one, uh, I'll just make uh, short uh, comments. Yeah, as I said, it's a very interesting paper to me. Uh, yeah, and uh, we, we are very curious about how the country is competitive in terms of uh, uh, human resources uh, development. And uh, he suggested uh, uh, alternative measure Okay, to uh, measure the uh, com uh, national competitiveness. But as he, he criticized other measures, and the one he proposed here is subject to the same uh, criticisms uh, because uh, when he constructed this measure, uh, he kind of used ad hoc assumptions and they have to be justified. Okay. And for example, uh, in supply conditions, he has demand condition and supply conditions. In supply conditions, uh, he included certain uh, factors, but uh, I mean, I think male-female ratio in population may, could be included in the supply condition, but it is omitted. And also the demand conditions, uh, you know, it could, it could be, we could, it, we could include paid and uh, self-employment ratio to uh, characterize the demand side of the employment. And uh, uh, so in conclusion, I mean, this is very, as I said, it's very informative, and it gives us uh, the pictures which countries are competitive. And, but uh, if we assume, if we add other factors, the rankings of the countries may, uh, may change, and we need to uh, check the uh, sensitivity of his measure. Okay? And that's, my, and that's all of my comments. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Professor Kim. Uh, it's a very creative way of delivering comments in slides. I like that. So, Dr. Angu Kim, it's your turn. Less than four or five minutes. <laughs> yeah, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, First of, uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Chairman. And uh, I'd like to appreciate uh, Dr. Archerena's good and comprehensive uh, presentation. And also appreciate Professor O's challenging index creating. Uh, I agree all to the Dr. Archerena's idea. And uh, I also agree almost uh, to the index created by Professor O. But uh, I recommend Professor O to insert human capital theory in his fr uh, frame. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Achorena's uh, explaining is the general point of view founded from the data all over the world. So, uh, I'd like to share Korean's specific facts and problems with Dr. Achorena, and I want to add some supplementary opinions, my opinions. Uh, from now on, uh, I'll speak in Korean to deliver my comment exactly. Uh, 주, 어, 많이들 아시듯이 그 한국에서 요즘 그 고등학교를 졸업하는 대부분의 학생들이 대학에 들어가고 있습니다. 그 비율이 최근에는 약 87%가 되고 있고요. 어, 앞서도 지적됐지만은 그렇지만 대졸자에 맞는 일자리의 공급이 정체되어 있어 대졸 청년들이 어, 취업에 많은 어려움을 겪고 있습니다. 
이첫 번째 슬라이드를 한번 봐주십시오. 이 표는 실업에 있는 청년 또 취업 준비를 하는 청년 일이 없는데 구직 활동도 하지 않는 청년 등 모두 취업에 어려움을 겪고 있는 청년의 비율을 나타낸 것입니다 연도별로 쭉 추이를 본 것인데요 표에서 나타나듯이 4년제 대학의 졸업생들이 가장 많이 취업에 어려움을 겪고 있습니다 아, 이렇게 그 취업에 어려움이 많이 나타나게 되자 그 한국에서 어떤 특이한 현상들이 나타나고 있는데요 다음 슬라이드를 보여드리겠습니다 어, 아, 이것은 뭐냐면 은그 대학생들이 한국에서 대학생들이 학과 공부 외에 취업을 위해서 부가적인 학습이나 훈련을 받고 있는 걸 보여주는 겁니다 이렇게 그 취업 준비를 부가적으로 하는 녹색, 어, 학생들이 4명에 1명의 비율로 나타나고 있습니다. 상당히 많은 것이죠. 그리고 이러한 그 취업 준비에 들어가는 비용이 1년에 거의 100만 원에 육박을 하고 있습니다. 어, 다음 슬라이드를 보여드리겠습니다. 그런데 어, 이렇게 그 취업 준비를 하는 사람들이 결국 그 어, 노동시장에 나가서는 더 나은 성과를 가져온다 하는 걸 보여주는 게 바로 이 표입니다 특히 이 표에서는 취업 준비를 아무것도 안 하는 학생들보다는 취업 준비를 하는 노력, 노력을 하는 학생들이 취업에 더 유리하고 또그 취업 준비도 일찍부터 취업 준비를 하는 학생들이 취업에 유리한 걸로 나, 나타나고 있습니다 어, 한국에서 나타나는 또 하나의 특징적인 현상은 대학을 졸업하고 어, 직업적인 지식과 기능을 다시 배우기 위해서 직업전문학교에 재입학하는 청년들의 숫자가 늘고 있다는 것입니다. 어, 이 표가 바로 그, 이 슬라이드가 바로 그것을 보여주는 것인데요. 그 직업전문학교 정원의 약반 정도를 대학을 마치거나 중퇴한 학생들이 차지하고 있습니다 그리고 이러한 학생들이 연도별로 지속적으로 늘어나고 있는 걸알 수가 있습니다 어, 저는 이러한 현상들이 한국의 대학 교육의 문제를 직접적으로 나타내는 것이라고 어, 생각을 해봤습니다 그런데 이게 다른 나라에서도 이러한 현상들이 나타나고 있는지는 의문입니다 어, 그리고 그이 대학 교육의 문제와 관련해서 어, 뭐한두 가지 점만 언급해 보고자 합니다. 첫 번째로는 대학 교육의 질입니다. 그 청년들이 대학 졸업자에 맞는 능력을 갖추고 대학을 졸업하는가 하는 문제인데요. 어, 이 문제는 대학 졸업자의 수요와 공급 일치에서 상당히 중요한 문제입니다. 어, 외국에서 어, 대학 공급자가 늘어나는 경우에 이러한 문제는 없는지 모르겠습니다. 그리고 오늘 오 교수님의 프리젠테이션에서도 이러한 대학 교육의 질을 측정하는 내용은 빠져 있는 것 같습니다. 두 번째로 한국의 산업 구조의 문제를 언급하고자 합니다. 이게 굉장히 중요한 부분인데요. 한국에서는 다수의 중소기업이 대기업과 계약을 맺고 대기업의 부품을 납품하는 이런 그 경제 구조를 가지고 있습니다. 그런데 이러한 원화청 계약에서 중소기업에서 생산된 많은 부가가치가 부당하게 대기업으로 이전이 되고 있습니다. 어, 이런 상황에서 중소기업이 잘 성장을 할수 없는 건 당연하고요. 어, 그렇게 되면서 중소기업에서는 대졸 청년들이 갈 만한 좋은 일자리를 만들어내고 있지 못한 게 현실입니다. 아, 이러한 그 우리나라 경제 산업 구조가 청년층의 전반적인 고학력화 맞물려 가지고 현재 대졸 청년층의 고용 문제로 나타났다고 생각이 됩니다. Uh, now I end my comments. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. <웃음> Kim. I was about to ask you to conclude. Thank you for your very well structured comments. So our lo- last discussion, Dr. Park. 
Thank you, Chairman. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be the last speaker of the last session of the forum. Uh, since I worked with Guangzhou Kim uh, to initiate the Global HR Forum in 2006, the first forum actually, uh, participating in the forum as a speaker is very meaningful to me. Uh, as Mr. Acho Arena mentioned, 81 million, almost 40% of the unemployed people in the world are, the, are youth, aged 15 to 24. Uh, many youth leave school without skills. They need to succeed in the work por work por uh, workplace. Therefore, uh, many countries eager to set up the mechanism uh, of a close connection between school and the uh, labor market. Uh, similar to uh, Professor O of Seoul National University, World Bank education team recently initiated a benchmarking workforce development project to offer systematic help to the client countries. As a team member of the project, I would like to provide you a conceptual framework for the workforce development, benchmarking workforce development. Uh, this slide shows the key elements of a conceptual framework. It recognizes that achieving coherence in workforce development policies requires a simultaneous consideration of the demand for skills as well as supply. Where performing workforce development systems realize a high degree of skills match in terms of the aggregate supply of skilled workers relative to the demand as well as in the quality of skills. Uh, in such systems, inputs and services from a variety of entities are routinely mobilized to meet the skills requirements of employers in a timely manner. In the best systems, important benefits accrue in the form of a more productive workforce, higher rates of employment, progress in a fight against poverty, and for the economy as a whole, tangible movement of the value chain of economic activity. Uh, the alternative scenario of the weak system delivering a poor match between skills demand and supply cannot be ruled out, however. Uh, in such systems, the results include unemployment and under, um, underemployment, often coexisting the chronic skills gaps felt by employers, emigration of skilled workers, and an economy showing few signs of upgrading its technological capability. In order to create a tractable tool for evaluating the performance of workforce development systems, we propose to focus on a common set of 10 key performance drivers uh, that can be applied across a wide range of countries. Uh, by collecting data on these drivers from knowledgeable informants drawn uh, mostly from practitioners in the country using a structured interview protocol. The project would make it possible to assess the current status of a country's workforce development system and ascertain its position on a scale ranging from a latent uh, to a cutting edge stage of development. The 10 performance drivers fall into three domains. Uh, economic ambitions in, include the leadership and vision for skills formation strategy, employer uh, participation in fostering skills demand, and the governance and coordination of a workforce development system. Uh, domain two, service delivery capacity and quality involves uh, five performance drivers. Uh, first, the resources and the leveraging of a partnership and system-wide management, administrative and digital infrastructure, a third institutional arrangements for financing, provision and accountability, first regulation and quality assurance, lastly, uh, monitoring and evaluation practices. Uh, domain three, uh, Domain three, uh, in, um, system uh, designs involve two performance drivers, provision for uh, diversification and articulation, and system innovation. 
the proposed uh, the drivers have been chosen to describe the authorizing environment for workforce development, the operational arrangements, and the system coherence. The proposed drivers can be given meaningful interpretation, interpretations uh, for the system as a whole or the components of the system, including individual institution. Uh, because workforce development issues are highly complex, the, this benchmarking exercise is view, best viewed as an explore, exploratory project at this time. It will therefore be implemented with appropriate caution and openness to running. Uh, three phases of the work and in besides them. The first involving the preparation and validation of a set of diagnostic questionnaire for collecting com comparable data across countries. Uh, the second, a uh, beta testing the questionnaire in two or three countries, and the third, piloting the application of the tool in the small sample of countries. Uh, today, I just introduced a brief concept of benchmarking workforce development project. I hope uh, our team can provide the results of the benchmarking in the next Global HR Forum. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Park, for uh, sharing us with uh, your uh, initiative on this benchmarking. Uh, you forgot to mention that UNESCO uh, Bangkok is part of this. Well, I tried my best to manage the time, but I realized that we have only 10 minutes to go. So uh, I will open the floor to, for you. But before that, um, please be provocative. Are, there, are we missing any important points in Davis presentation or the index uh, presented by Professor? Are you convinced with this index? Do you think this index with you, this index, can you reasonably predict that a country can produce a competitive workforce? Well, anyhow, so who would like to go first? First, I will collect a few questions from the floor and then ask the panel to respond. Please you raise your hand. Okay, Suhas first. I know who you are, but please tell us who you are and make your point short. Hello. Uh, yes, I'm Suhas Parandekar from the World Bank. I was very intrigued by Professor O's presentation. I really liked the idea of having an index like the World Economic Forum Index and the other global competitive indexes, indices for a global human development index. Uh, but I would like to agree with the discussant uh, about the criticism of the index being the same as the Professor O criticized the other index in terms of what is the counterfactual because a lot of the variables which you included there, other variables <coughs> have been there uh, as well. Uh, I mean, you could make a plausible story. So one of the suggestions really, GJ, that I was thinking uh, that might be tried out is if there is possibility of taking that index back in time to calculate the same value of that index for the previous year and then look at the prediction of that index currently because we don't know the future which countries are going to be more competitive mm -hmm. but we know the current and so we can see how simulate the performance uh, of the index and then try some alternative measures that is probably a much better approach uh, than trying to come up with a theory which I mean I commend the professor for trying but it's very difficult how do you how, what is the theory behind a country's global uh, you know human development being competitive it's, it's, it, it would be very complicated theory so uh, so maybe an empirical approach may, 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 may be better suited just a suggestion Thank you, Suhas. It's a suggestion and question, if I'm not mistaken, right? So who is going to be next? Please raise your hand. Harry? On the um, uh, index, uh, again, um, 
one one thing I, I liked about the the presentation is um, particularly liked about the presentation is the uh, attention to um, theory. And if I understood uh, correctly, um, you see a deficiency in other uh, indices in terms of their uh, theoretical foundation. Uh, but then that seems to get you into the uh, problem that the discussant and, and Sue has mentioned about the justification of, uh, of, of the indicators. I think the suggestion Suhas has is, is a very useful one, but I have a slightly different um, uh, question. Um, I can see the, the, the value in measuring the, the things you, you um, uh, tried to measure, but I'm wondering what the value of, an, uh, of another index is. Um, and with the competitiveness index that you mentioned, uh, I've heard of uh, countries um, asking for uh, consultancies and such to improve their ranking in the system and trying to find where uh, uh, in the variables it's easier to make progress in order to get a higher ranking. The problem with that is that it might not actually be a real improvement and other countries are also doing that as well. So a country that makes real progress may improve in real terms, but because of the ranking, it doesn't look like they improved. So you made analysis of your index in terms of what, what it means if you disaggregate. I find that much more useful than the uh, ranking of where a, a country is. So trying to use the information for um, uh, evaluating policy or understanding uh, what's happening in a country, and I think um, that would be uh, a lot of value. But keep the, the theoretical uh, framework that you have, which is one of the strengths of um, the approach. Thanks. Thank you. Perhaps one more question. Any question or comments on youth transition, which is the very topic of this session? Okay, I see none. So may I ask Professor Lowe to, re to respond first? Thank you very much for all the comments for the index. You know, uh, whenever we uh, see the index evaluation, you know, there are a lot of there can be a lot of critics and suggestions, and uh, uh, and I would like to really appreciate those comments. And there is always. Uh, trade-off relationship between the scope of the number of countries evaluated and the uh, number of indicators. If I want to expand the target uh, countries evaluated, uh, I should uh, lose some indicators. So uh, between, uh, within that limitation, I uh, tried my best to have some theoretical foundation first and then uh, collect uh, indicators based on previous research. So uh, for international comparison, uh, I think there uh, we need to consider those uh, limitations. And also uh, some, for some measures, uh, even though those measures are based on theoretical model, uh, we couldn't find the uh, hard data. So uh, for that case, we need to uh, invest more money in collecting uh, data set in, in, in international context. And, and also another uh, good suggestion about the value of index. You know, uh, composite score sometimes uh, may not provide uh, the specific implication for policy. Uh, but uh, for many other uh, evaluation study, uh, that just uh, can rebuild the position of one country. And more information uh, can come from the specific determinant. You know, international uh, comparison can give us uh, uh, each country's a specific uh, position in each uh, categories. So that's, uh, that's the main purpose of this index. And, and I think uh, uh, next step is to uh, analyze more uh, predictive validity of this measure. Uh, like uh, the first commenter uh, uh, said, uh, time one and time two uh, comparison is very important. But if we come back to uh, to early stage, you know, uh, there 
there are so many missing data. So I think uh, the relevant uh, time period should be reflected in the index development. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Law. I would suggest you talk to the experts from World Bank after the session if you have the time. I think it's, you will have a very inter interesting exchange. Now, I would ask David to re re react to commentators, if you have any, briefly. Thank you. Maybe I will start with your question about uh, guidance and counseling, how to, to guide uh, students for jobs that do not yet exist. Well, of course, that sounds like an impossible uh, task. But I think there are two, two elements uh, in relation to this, uh, this theme. One is I think it's, it's uh, important to ensure that uh, uh, students are uh, exposed to um, labor market reality and, and to, to um, the workplace. Uh, it's also important that they have information about the, the features of uh, families of, of occupations. Having said that, uh, we also know that two key elements are, I would say, uh, are essential to ensure lifelong employability. I mean, one is to avoid uh, early specialization. In other words, to, to keep as long as possible the education uh, general and as broad as possible. And secondly, is also to, to prepare during uh, compulsory education uh, for lifelong learning. In other words, to, to also impart the, the skills, the attitudes that will facilitate, you know, over life, over time, uh, people to uh, retrain and eventually to uh, adjust to changing labor market conditions. So those two elements, I think, are, are essential. Now, a number of uh, comments were made uh, in relation to other parameters that uh, are key to understand uh, youth employment or unemployment. One of them, of course, is the cost of labor. In fact, this is a very uh, a tricky question. The relationship between the, the cost of labor and employment is, is not an easy one. Um, we know that many countries have implemented measures to reduce uh, the cost uh, of uh, young uh, workers. Uh, with mixed results, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not easy to, to uh, I mean, there is no uh, absolute uh, uh, solution in this respect. In many countries, we've seen that uh, there was a, a kind of uh, deadweight effect where employers actually took benefit from those measures, but without really increasing uh, the employment of young people. So manipulating the cost of labor is not an easy uh, mechanism. The other reality uh, relates to the competition between the older workers and the young workers. And again, uh, depending on the specific national uh, conditions, we see countries where there is de facto a kind of uh, social contract where uh, workers do protect you know, uh, their situation uh, and at the cost of, uh, of a new entrance in the system. So again, there is this dimension to, to take into account and this relationship between the, the old workers and the newcomers is, uh, varies from, from country to, to country. Um, another uh, comment uh, in relation to uh, market solutions. I mean, are there market solutions to solve this? Well, we know that by itself, I mean, the market does not necessarily reach an equilibrium. No? And therefore, this is why it's important also to, to provide incentives uh, and regulations to, to some extent. We know also that the uh, equilibrium which is reached is not necessarily equitable. So this is, again, the other dimension. I mean, to what extent, uh, you know, some categories of young people are actually excluded from, from, from employment. So this is something which also that needs to be uh, considered. Now in relation to the specific uh, situation in, in Korea, uh, I think here I'd like to make two, two comments. First of all, I mean, this, uh, I mean we've heard uh, several times today that there is an oversupply of university graduates in, in, in Korea. Well, again, I think it is difficult to make such a statement because I think that the uh, employment uh, dimension is only one of the dimensions to uh, assess the performance of, of higher education and the role of higher education in society. Uh, so there might be uh, a benefit and there might be a preference in, North, in, in, in Korea for, uh, in fact, uh, you know, a high level of participation in higher education, which is not related 
you know, to you know, benefit on, on, on the labor market. And in a context where, in fact, the, the cost is, uh, you know, to a large extent in Korea, uh, uh, borne by families, I think it's, it's the country in, among the OECD countries where private financing is the highest, you know, there could be some, I would say, uh, uh, rational to such uh, a situation which is not uh, explained by the labor market situation. We also have to understand that to some extent there has been a, a mismatch between the education expansion and uh, uh, the changing uh, uh, structure of employment on the labor market. I mean, there has been uh, a lot of, um, well, literature on the impact of the knowledge economy on the structure of employment and in fact what we uh, do see is that in many countries it is true that the, there has been an increase uh, at the top level for really highly qualified positions but we also notice that uh, at the bottom of the labor market there is still a residual I would say a stock of, uh, of jobs uh, which are very, um, with very low level of qualifications. And this stock does not seem to, to, to diminish. So, you know, there is, uh, um, I mean, the dynamics of the labor market is not as, as linear as the expansion uh, in the education system. And I think this is also what we are uh, um, observing now in, um, in Korea. Thank you, David. I think it has been very useful uh in terms of identifying key issues, key issues you transition in terms of measuring a country's progress towards delivering uh, quality results of education and training, uh, as far as I can see. Uh, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, please join me in thanking them for their wonderful presentation and the wonderful comments. And thank you all for your patience to the very end of this forum. And on behalf of all of us, I would like to express my sincere thanks to the organizer. The president of Korea was sitting over there right now. Okay. There is the uh, president, Kwon Dae-bong, of Korea. Thank you very much for organizing this and uh, inviting me to this occasion. So with that, I will declare that this session is over. Thank you very much. Thank you.